It's my pleasure to call Professor Kari Bo to the platform. Kari is well known to all the physiotherapists in the audience and probably most everybody else for her uh, prodigious publication list, which we've all devoured over the years. Kari is a physical therapist uh, and a teacher in the area of pelvic floor dysfunction and pelvic floor muscle training. She's the former vice chancellor of the Norwegian School of Sports Science, the vice president of the International Organisation of Physical Therapists in Women's Health, the Norwegian Sport Physiotherapy Association and the Norwegian Council for Physio Th Physical Th Activity. But more than that, she is a wonderful researcher and is a person who uses research to guide practice and that's what she's going to talk to us about today. So I invite you to the uh, podium, Kari, and thank you. Thank you so much for this nice uh, invitation to come here. I really have appreciated my six weeks uh, uh, away from Norway, and you can see why, because I like the beach, and this is my campus for the moment, so uh, it's really great to be here. So the presentation today is about changing practice on the basis on evidence or on what. In 1981, McKinley uh, presented a model which he called the seven stages in the career of a medical innovation. And it was made in a quite humorous way, but I think he meant it seriously, because this model is about how clinical practice changes. So first you have a promising report or a physical therapist or another person presenting something in the uh, in a conference or other places based maybe on a clinical observation or a case report or a short, uh, short clinical series. Then there is professional and organizational adaptation of the innovation, so people start to do that. You use what your colleague had told you. The public accepts the innovation and the state or the third party pays for the innovation. Then it becomes standard procedure and it gets into textbook and there is still no critical evaluation of if this is really working. And then you have RCT, a randomized control trial. And in most cases, uh, and we all know that who have done several randomized control trials, they are not as effective as you th think they are in clinical practice. So all of us really get uh, disappointed when we do RCT because the effect is not that big as we thought it should be. But some studies really show good effect as well. But after that, there may be professional denunciation of the procedure or the treatment, and then maybe erosion or professional support and even discredit. Or it goes on as if the RCT had never been done. So they don't care, so they just continue as it is. And this was actually taken up by Wall, Lewis Wall in 2001 and published in the International Urogynecology Journal. His concern was the TVT and the new operations going through this path. So this is happening in all areas, I think. So this is one view of looking at medicine. Voltaire said that the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. <laughs> so that's one way of looking at it. But of course, we want to look, it, look at it in this way by Sackett saying that evidence-based medicine is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about care of individual patients. So we all know the hierarchy of evidence, starting on clinical experience and then maybe supported by basic research, experimental animal or human physiology trials, and then observational studies like cross-sectional studies, case control and cohort studies, and then individual RCTs, and on top the meta-analysis or animal control trials and systematic reviews of the same studies. And why is it that we want to have this hierarchy? Because of the internal validity. Internal validity is to which extent the changes observed are caused by the experiment or the intervention or let's say physiotherapy and not by confounding factors. And the confounding factors are huge when we are in clinical practice. And there are lots of threats to internal validity. The history going on at the same time when you're doing your excellent intervention, maturation, testing procedures, and the test itself has a learning effect, so it may change. Instrumentation, 
And the most important thing is the statistical regression, because it will be, in most other cases, that patients come to us at the worst point, and there will be some changes anyway. Selection biases, experimental mortality, selection maturation interaction, and expectancy, which is also very important. So the randomized controlled trial is the gold standard for um, controlling most of these um, threats to internal validity. And that's why we use it. So the historical development in physiotherapy has come from clinical experience where we had no data. And that was when I was educated. It was really frustrating to be a physiotherapy student in Norway in the late 70s. And I had actually, I was lucky because I had one year in sports science first. And that was much more evidence in that area. And everyone uses references. Coming to physiotherapy, it was really nothing. It was so frustrating. Then we had a period of theory, and that came from movement science, and I think from Australia, actually. And then we got some data, but this data was based on small experimental studies from neurophysiology, education, psychology, and biomechanics. And we need these sort of studies, but they cannot be used to change clinical practice, but they are. And then we have the new area with clinical trials, randomized controlled trials, and then we have data which show effect size, meaning the difference between a control group and actual intervention. And that's what we need to change practice. And we can be very proud as physical therapists today, seeing this development of randomized controlled trials from the Pedro database in Sydney. And these are the data from June 2011, more than seven. 15,000 randomized controlled trials in general in physiotherapy, a lot of reviews and a lot of guidelines as well. When it comes to pelvic floor muscle training, we are really happy in this area because we have systematic reviews. We have the Cochrane reviews, more than 60 randomized controlled trials. We have the NICE guidelines saying that there's level A uh, with uh, pelvic floor muscle training. And this is based on high quality studies that supervise pelvic floor muscle training for at least three months. This should be the first line treatment for stress urinary and mixed urinary incontinence. And also all the ICI uh, consensus saying the same level one grade A. And the last um, systematic review from Imamura saying the same. So we know today that pelvic floor muscle training for stress urinary incontinence and mixed urinary incontinence should go through this pathway as first line treatment. So we should all be using that in this area. If we go a, more, a little bit more into details of these studies, if you look at Q rate, it's a huge difference though between studies. As you can see here from 35% and this is pad testing and up to 80% Q rate. So big difference there. And you can wonder why that is. When it goes in, we go into the studies on overactive bladder, the evidence is not really that strong. There are only four randomized controlled trials in this area, and two of them do not show any effect. So this is one of my concerns with all the systematic reviews. So if they put urge incontinence women or studies, including both uh, stress union incontinence and urgency incontinence, then they are maybe diluting the results because it doesn't seem to be that effective in urgency incontinence. And this may be because the pathophysiology is not clear in urgency incontinence and the theory and the basic research does though support a possible effect because we know that during a contraction of the pelvic floor there is an inhibition of the detrusor. So the question here is also on the content and the dosage of the intervention that has been used in urgency incontinence. I think this is an area that we need to do much more research and based on high quality randomized controlled trials using uh, theory in this area and how we should treat it and it would possibly be different from stress urinary incontinence. When it comes to stress urinary incontinence, there are actually two theories uh, in the area and uh, the first one I will mention is the one that was published in 1998 by uh, John Dulancey's group from Janice Miller. She looked at 27 women with mean age of 68.4 years with mild to moderate stress urinary incontinence. 
and they were taught to do a pre-contraction and hold this contraction during cough and then sent back home just to do that for a week and they got back to the laboratory and did a new pad testing with and without the NAC, which they, this terminology they use. And by simply doing this uh, method, they reduced the urine loss from medium to deep cough by average of 98% and up to 73%. So this is a very effective method. Although we do not know how strong does your NAC has to be to be effective, because we don't think that any contraction would be able to stop this. So we have a lot of knowledge that we need to find out in this area as well. However, when you look into the peripheral muscle training protocols for stress urinary incontinence, very few of the studies have used the NAC. So this was looking into the first Cochrane review and the 36 studies looking at solely stress urinary incontinence. And out of these first 36 randomized controlled trials, only four of them had used the NAC. And the other studies then used uh, peripheral muscle strength training. So the type of exercises in all these trials were pelvic floor muscle training. The intensity, which is a big question, how can we really define intensity? So what we use is the holding period, varies between three seconds and up to 40 seconds. And personally, I don't think it's possible to hold a maximal contraction for 40 seconds. I don't know what you can do, but I think that's quite difficult. The repetitions vary between eight to 12 contractions three times per day. That's our studies from Norway and up to 200 contraction. And you may all know that Kegel, he advocated like 600 contractions per day, which is really none of the athletes in the world when they are strengthening the muscles are doing that sort of training. Frequency, all the studies have used everyday training. And the duration of the intervention period vary between six weeks and up to six months. So a huge variation in the intervention. And of course, the intervention will uh, um, affect uh, the results of what we are doing. And there were few reports in the beginning in this area of adherence. So have they actually done the training that we are asking them to do, which is, of course, also very important to know about. However, today we know that more is better than less. In our first randomized controlled trial from Norway, we showed that those who were exercising with a physical therapist once a week in a group setting, in addition to home training and also assessment every month, they improved in the muscle strength uh, to a significantly higher level compared to the control group training at home only, but having the same individual sessions, so, so sev seven sessions with the physical therapist. And there also was a huge difference in the actual amount of leakage based on this. So this was back in 1990, establishing that you can't just leave the patients alone to do this training. After that, we, there are several studies that have confirmed that more is better than less, and that we have to have supervised peripheral muscle training to find a good effect. So that should be done in clinical practice today.